Welcome, everyone, to another edition of Inside Lyme Podcast with your host, Dr. Daniel Cameron. In tonight's episode, Dr. Cameron will be discussing the case of a 71-year-old woman who was initially diagnosed with urlichia, a tick-borne illness, but was later found to actually have Guillain-Barr syndrome. Good evening, Dr. Cameron. Thank you for joining us. And thank you, Darlene, for leading this discussion. Now, this is a, a, a fairly unique case. We don't read about this very much, do we, in the, in the literature? No, um, you know, there's so many uh, presentations of Lyme. Now, this is actually uh, an acute presentation, someone who's fresh. Uh, and so a lot of times in the Lyme community, we don't catch people the first week or two they're sick. They're often in the hospital. They often have these kind of issues that we don't address. So the authors of this paper uh, from ID cases uh, gave us some unique insight into this woman's condition. But now, can you can you talk a little bit about the initial symptoms? I, I I understand they occurred over a three week period. Yeah, the woman initially had what seems, uh, in hindsight, to ehrlichia. There was some weakness, dizziness, visual change, chills, fever, and neck and abdominal pain. And so, there's always a broad range of issues when it comes to tick borne illness. There are some clues that ehrlichia. Uh, which is now two different infections, uh, Ehrlichia as well as anaplasmosis. And so they have noted from the very beginning that they had a low platelet count, liver function tests were up, and, uh, and that with an insect bite, a positive Ehrlichia test by PCR and not fighting other illness led them to the diagnosis of Ehrlichia. Now that, in this that, case, uh, that um, um, seems straight, straightforward, uh, might as well take doxycycline. And of course, she responded like you'd expect with uh, doxycycline. The, these symptoms, though, could also, um, you also find those in Lyme disease, right? So that do the, these two conditions present similarly? Yeah, I find they're, they're quite similar. And so whenever I see someone with Ehrlichia uh, from a tick, I'm always concerned there might be Lyme disease. Uh, or another tick-borne infection like Babesia. And the treatment might change based on what we call co-infections. So when someone goes to the ER and they're told they have a low platelet count, high liver function test, oftentimes uh, the doctor focuses just on Ehrlichia. And in practice is that if when you only focus on Ehrlichia and only do the treatment for Ehrlichia, it may not be long enough. It may not be enough to treat some of the other infections. So my red flag goes up uh, whenever I hear uh, a positive test for one infection. That means that I have to look for some other tick-borne infection, make sure that uh, there isn't any comorbidity from another inf infection. Is, um, do you tend to see your lichia diagnosed in certain regions of the country? Does it show up more? Yeah, I think um, the Ehrlichia is, and anaplasmosis seem to have a slightly different pattern. Uh, the Northeast United States seems to have more of an anaplasmosis pattern, and, but there's Ehrlichia in other parts of the country. And the reason I don't you know, put out stats or worry too much about stats is that these ticks are moving around, the birds are moving the ticks around. And so any articles that say this is what they saw is there's another article come along saying, well, I actually saw this or I saw that tick or like a Lone Star tick isn't, isn't really in the Lone Star state of Texas. Uh, it's actually in a broad range of areas of the country, including the Northeast United States. So now th this woman was, was treated, as you mentioned, with doxycycline and her symptoms improved, but then she sort of had a, um, her symptoms worsened one week later, right? Yeah, this woman um, uh, had an unsteady gait, uh, which implies uh, there might be some motor problems. Although there's other causes of unsteady gait, she, she was sick enough to require a walker. She also had tingling in her feet, difficulty urination. So 
Uh, and her difficult urination was enough that she needed a straight Foley catheterization. So there's two motor issues, the gait problems, the need to walk her, and I guess the, uh, the catheterization along with sensory. And uh, that the doctors uh, came along and decided that that was Guillain-Barre syndrome. Uh, and Guillain-Barre syndrome is, uh, is where the immune system attacks the nerves. Uh, we commonly think of in medical school and is that different types of uh, infections, respiratory infections and GI infections can lead to Guillain-Barre syndrome. Mm -hmm. uh, but the authors of this article pointed out that there are other infections uh, in this case, uh, because there was such clear evidence of Ehrlichia, uh, the author concluded that, uh, that this is worth writing about, that that tick-borne illness can lead to uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome. Now, how do they diagnose that, that syndrome? They didn't say as clear cut as I would like, um, but uh, clinically they treat it with IVIG. You know, sometimes uh, uh, if you do a motor exam, you know, see how weak the extremities are, uh, you might do a EMG. So you might be able to prove that they have a, a neuropathy in the legs. Uh, the other thing with Guillain-Barre syndrome, if it progresses past the legs, it can go into the hips, the chest, uh, and uh, progress to the, the uh, up, uh, up the body. And it can be bad enough uh, in the respiratory area that one might not be able to breathe on their own. And there's a certain number of people that die from Guillain-Barre syndrome. So the fact that this uh, woman looked like a simple case of Ehrlichia, the doctors uh, were able to uh, diagnose Guillain-Barre and come up with an effective treatment for her. Now, because they said she was discharged to rehab center means it wasn't a quick, simple recovery. And Gavare uh, is often a, uh, uh, a kind of condition where you don't get a quick, clean improvement. Now, it was, it was interesting that the authors mentioned that uh, with COVID outbreak, there have been reported cases of uh, COVID uh, inducing this condition as well. Yeah, I think um, they're still trying to work out uh, um, uh, that, uh, that connection. And so when I've researched it out and looked at it, is that there's always a debate about um, how often Guillain-Barre occurs. Does it occur as a random event in a COVID situation or is it, are they linked? And uh, this is uh, always the, the, the subject. And so one could say on this case, did the two events, uh, are the two events connected? Is there Ehrlichia connected to the Guillain-Barre for this particular person? But the timing was so good, the response uh, was so good that uh, that's, uh, that's why it was written up and uh, for us to discuss it today. And now, and this, uh, this patient actually did improve then with IVIG. Right. Yeah, they improved, but they got discharged to a rehab facility. So uh, they didn't say whether they needed rehab for bladder uh, because of the catheterization issues or because she couldn't walk very well. Um, but that uh, it does take a while for Guillain-Barre to get better, even with IVIG. And IVIG is intravenous immune globulin. And you know, the authors had mentioned that there's no evidence of other tick-borne illnesses, including Lyme disease, Babesia, uh, and the Bourbon virus. Could you talk a little bit about the Bourbon virus? In the blog, I, I felt I should discuss Bourbon virus some because uh, it, it's uh, something um, that you hear of, uh, that you know, we hear in the Northeast United States about Kwasin. But since this person is from Eastern Connecticut, sorry, Eastern Kentucky, is that uh, there's uh, some reports of a virus in a tick called Bourbon virus, named after the town, uh, a town called Bourbon. And uh, so we don't see enough, of, enough uh, Bourbon virus to uh, be able to report one personally, but 
in the case report by the CDC, they talked about a 50 year old man who had several ticks, enlarged lymph nodes, a rash, low platelets, low white count, and nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. And I remember they said low uh, platelets and low white count. So it shows that those findings are not unique just to Ehrlichia. And this uh, person went on to have fevers, sore joints, headaches, and arthralgias. And they went to a further workup because they had given a tetracycline, which is similar to doxycycline, and the patient failed that tetracycline treatment. And the patient uh, went on to multi-organ failure and died 11 days after the onset of the illness from a cardiopulmonary arrest. And so um, they didn't go to every detail in this uh, case report, but if you go to that CDC website, at least it gives you a lot more details about the bourbon virus. And uh, uh, I thought it was worth regret, uh, regressing to understand uh, what a bourbon virus uh, presentation might be like. Now, it could be that there's bourbon viruses out there that we just haven't discovered yet, uh, but it's still uh, worth noting that the CDC has recognized the bourbon virus as, a, as an important tick-borne illness. Now, um, do you think you, you could sp speak a little bit about uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome, what actually what it is and um, what might cause it? Yeah, Guillain-Barre syndrome or GBS is a, it's an acute autoimmune demyelinating polyneuropathy. So let me break that down. It's acute. Uh, autoimmune means uh, even though they're saying the word to autoimmune, um, I tend not to use the auto when I know what the cause is or I suspect the cause. So when they say it's from respiratory issues or gut issues, uh, normally I wouldn't say autoimmune, I just say acute immune. But you know, that's the terminology they're using. Demyelinating means the immune system is attacking the, the nerves and we know if it attacks the nerves in Lyme, you get demyelination. And polyradicular neuropathy means it affects more, more than one area. And radicula means it's following a nerve. And then a neuropathy is uh, the nerve itself. So that's why it's called officially acute autoimmune demyelinating polyradicular neuropathy. So Guillain-Barre, even though it's a hard to pronounce, is certainly a, less of a mouthful than that. There are a number of causes of Guillain-Barre syndrome. Uh, in this case, the uh, authors reminded us that typically it would be a respiratory or a gastroenterology issue, but there have been cases, uh, not that often, but Lyme disease, tick paralysis, uh, AIDS, West Nile virus uh, can also uh, lead to it. And, uh, and there's like a one million chance that even the flu vaccine can lead to Guillain-Barre syndrome. So whenever you get to one in a million, you don't know how much is by chance or how much is uh, an infection. So it just reminds us that there's, uh, as an author, that, uh, that we need to be thinking about Guillain-Barre syndrome, but you might not know what the cause is, but uh, you should treat the underlying illness and be treating with IVIG. I can also mention that steroids don't seem to be helpful. There's a, there's a, people who die from Guillain-Barre syndrome, but their authors said that 85% of patients recover their independent ambulation. In this case, they were in the, we don't know if they ever were independent because uh, they went to a rehab facility. So lastly, the authors said that, that whenever you have Guillain-Barre, you should consider what they call a broad differential. That means there can be a variety of of causes instead of only relying on respiratory and gastroenterology problems. Have you seen this in your practice? No, um, I have an outpatient practice. And so some cases I don't see because they tend to be hospital-based issues. This was a more of a hospital-based issue. Uh, what I do see are more of the chronic end of the spectrum. Uh, in fact, a lot of people will uh, um, 
or might know about chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy, which is sometimes called CIDP. So let me break that down. It's chronic, it's inflammatory, uh, whereas the Guillain-Barre is, they're using the word autoimmune. Again, the word demyelinating and polyneuropathy means more than one nerve. So you see everybody has their own ideas of what to call it. In Lyme disease, uh, I tend to see more of the chronic uh, expressions. We often hear the word CIDP. C stands for chronic. I is inflammatory, demyelinating, and polyneuropathy. So once again, it's chronic, it's inflammatory, it affects the nerves, so demyelinating, and more than one nerve. And uh, in that case, uh, if it's caused from Lyme, then um, I like to treat the Lyme disease or the co-infection. Uh, some patients benefit from IVIG, but I always try to make sure there's no uh, uh, persistent infection. And I find uh, uh, quite a few of my patients fit that spectrum. But uh, there's a couple of the spectrums that are kind of being discussed on the acute end. Uh, like there's a what they call acute motor axonal, now, sorry, acute motor axonal neuropathy, where it's acute, it's motor, and it affects the nerves. And there's another one called acute motor sensory. Now, years ago, when I started in practice, uh, the uh, paper by Legigian uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine said that there was a lot of people with sensory axonal neuropathy. Uh, so that, so I'm showing around these terms to show you that the axons involved and neuropathy is involved, and it's not just acute. There's a chronic uh, presentations, and so stay tuned. If someone's having a, acute or a chronic neurologic presentations, remember to look for uh, ticks instead of just uh, respiratory or or GI problems. Well, thank you so much for for covering this topic. We don't hear much about it, and um... For viewers who would like to learn more, you can um, read about this as well in Dr. Daniel Cameron's blog. And the, the case is entitled um, Case of Eulichiosis Induced Guillain Barr Syndrome in a 71 year old female. Thank you again, Dr. Cameron, for speaking with us. And thank you, Darlene, for carrying the discussion.